Did you know that before winter, millions of birds and insects in the most extreme latitudes fly not towards the equator, but towards the poles? And that those animals, when given tracking devices, lose their tracking signal? Did you know that mosquitoes in the northernmost landmass, Greenland, are so large and aggressive, they can take out a caribou calf? And did you know that explorers at the South Pole have reported that after a certain latitude, the sub-zero temperatures suddenly rise dramatically, yielding green, iceless land areas and lakes? This strange evidence of warmer regions all indicate that the North and South Pole may hold secrets beyond the idea of Santa Claus. In fact, they support a theory about Earth that some of the most celebrated geologists and astronomers have believed, that Earth is a spherical, spacious planetary body with enormous continent-sized caverns deep within it and large entrances miles across at the North and South Pole. They say inner Earth has water, oceans, and luminosity, and that it sustains not only plants and animals, but intelligent life. If this sounds like heresy, lay aside what you think you know, and we'll show you the evidence, the scientists, the legends, and testimonies behind the inner Earth theory so that you can see why it may be the most game-changing information ever concealed from common knowledge. That miles beneath your feet are ideal conditions for a life-sustaining and inhabitable inner Earth. Who wasn't taught that gravity is what makes an apple fall? We've believed this for roughly three or four hundred years, since Isaac Newton defined it and its relationship to mass. Well, in 2017, two neutron stars collided and proved, indeed, it's not a force. It's actually a distortion in space-time. According to Einstein, an apple falls from a tree because the apple's responding to a curvature of space-time caused by the planet's mass there's no attractive force called gravity. Fair to say that's a massive paradigm shift. So if we were wrong about gravity, could we be wrong about other theories, particularly those that involve it? How we measure Earth's mass. Today, the Cavendish experiment measures the mass of one object based on its tug to another. But even before the redefining of gravity, this theory had flaws. The gravitational conditions in a science lab are nothing like conditions in space, and the theory assumes that each particle exerts a fixed force upon all others, ruling out the very real possibility that particles near the surface of a planet might exert a force greater than those deep within it. So, if gravity is no longer a valid theory, and it's used to determine mass, and the mass of the Earth is overstated, then it follows that the masses of all other planets in the solar system are also overstated. If the Earth is cavernous or hollow, then so too is every other planet in the solar system. Some of the greatest scientific minds have challenged the theory of a dense Earth. Around the same time as Newton, geophysicist, mathematician, and astronomer Edmund Halley, who predicted the orbit of his comet, said the magnetic anomalies of the Earth could only be the result of a different composition. He believed that beneath the Earth's crust were two thick concentric shells and that each region potentially had its own atmosphere, luminosity, and was possibly even inhabited. If this idea sounds crazy, check out this NASA video taken showing Saturn's North Pole with the exact counter-rotating fields that Haley described. And in this rare NASA video of Jupiter's pole, you can count up to 15 of these counter-rotating cylinders. Haley also speculated that the poles would have access into Earth and that the aurora borealis was the result of light emanating from this counter-rotation, 
exactly as it does in the videos of these other planets. Watch this NASA video closely and you'll see that the Astralis Borealis appears to be clearly emanating from a dark point on the planet. If you overlay a map on the planet, it's exactly at the point of the South Pole. A hundred years later, Swiss mathematician and physicist Leonard Euler, who's still considered one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, also proposed that Earth was completely hollow with a central sun in the center, similar to what Halley proposed, agreeing with Halley that holes at the North and South Pole would provide access to it. Germany's most influential mathematician, Johann Carl Friedrich Gauss, in the early 1800s, stated, all of our Earth's history, physics, and geography could be explained by Earth being a hollow planet with entrances at the poles. Naturally, satellite images of the poles are going to disprove this craziness, right? Well, there's a problem. NASA's images and videos of poles are rare. They're hard to find. But when they are revealed, they often have cloud cover, ice cover, or questionable anomalies, like simply being blotted out. Stranger still, no planes or satellites are permitted to come within a certain distance of the poles. Well, in November 1968, a satellite photo of the North Pole was released. It showed a large polar opening in absence of cloud cover. Now it's possible a trick of time-based photography created this illusion, but satellite images since then showing serious anomalies do raise questions, particularly the one from Russian space station Mir in 1987, showing light emanating in a very mysterious fashion. And then there are other NASA images of the planets, Venus, Jupiter, the various moons all showing strange qualities or blotted out poles. In fact, how's it possible to have perfectly hexagonal angles on Saturn? Why do these images from space consistently have their poles concealed? Like this blotted one of Jupiter, where you can actually see light emanating from the center. Was Edgar Allan Poe correct when he said, Sometimes the best hiding place is the one that's in plain sight. Another anomaly in measuring Earth's mass happens when we study earthquakes. Since the early 1900s, seismograph readings have proved that Earth does have some density, but not without raising even more questions. You see, when an earthquake occurs, seismic waves are measurable as they spread but then the signals disappear entirely only to reappear further on. These shadow zones are believed to be the result of waves hitting a molten core, and there are complicated mathematics theorizing why. But even then, there are many inconsistencies with seismograph readings. It's not a tidy science. So with all things considered, could it be that the simplest solution is simply the accurate one? Is it possible the waves reverberate within a belt-like zone but disappear into very large caverns or underground seas miles beneath the Earth's outer crust? Would that just be too simple an explanation? If the possibility of inner oceans sounds strange, take note. The first of the deepest holes ever drilled into Earth was in Russia, beginning in 1970. It was called the Kola Super Deep Borehole, and it took 20 years to make. As is often the case when humans venture into the unknown, Kola left a few scientific theories in ruin. They discovered unprecedented heat, fossils at depths eight miles down, and the surprising result? Water, at far deeper depths than had previously been assumed. Then, in 2014, a team of 20 U.S. geophysicists using seismic readings discovered large bodies of water 400 miles into the Earth. They concluded that the mantle transition zone, a rock layer between 400 and 700 kilometers below the Earth's surface, could hold three times the amount of water in the world's oceans. One of the team's scientists said, 
This is direct evidence supporting the hypothesis that the deep Earth holds a lot of water. Modern science can't confirm the physical structure of Earth's interior as a fact. And there are many questions about the existing theory. For example, a forming planet has zero gravity in its center, so its mass accumulates where gravitational and centrifugal forces are balanced, creating a sphere with openings at the top and bottom, like a hurricane of matter in space, not as a solid body. This energetic flow, the torus, is a self-organizing system in nature where energy expands and returns to itself. We see it every day in an orange, a whirlpool, a tornado. It's in the atom, the galaxy. None of these is a dense system. So, let's consider another possibility. Over millions of years, the planet has succumbed to a combination of forces responsible for shaping it. Heating, cooling, convection, carving by lava, running water, and glaciers, but also centrifugal forces, which create inner spaces in a mass revolving on an axis. These natural forces could make a planet more like a honeycomb or Swiss cheese than a perfectly solid rock. So current models of Earth's interior are not fact, they're theories. In the meantime, look at the facts you do know. Every continent has extensive cavernous networks, like Sun Dung Cave in Vietnam, with its jungles, rivers, and space to fit a 40-story skyscraper. And there's Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, USA which is even longer than the 400 miles of it which have so far been explored. Who's to say these spectacular naturally occurring spaces are not found at deeper depths? According to laws of physics, empty spaces are unnatural in nature. So caves have their own ecosystems and water bodies, plant life, animal life. If they extend deep into the earth, life will still fill it, even the most unhospitable depths of the ocean have life forms and creatures that have adapted to the darkness by creating their own luminosity. As Aristotle said, nature abhors a vacuum. Wherever there is a void, the universe seeks to fill it. So if enormous caverns like those we already know of continue on to reach deep into the earth, what then could be residing in the space miles beneath our feet? Since we're prohibited from flying over or seeing the poles, and we're prohibited from exploring caves without permits or assigned guides, how might we know what exists in inner Earth? Interestingly enough, many of the accounts of this strange, unique land have been told by very respected, credible people. But first, let's look at history. Almost every ancient culture shares legends about interactions with subterranean races. Clearly, some of these are considered to be purgatory for sinners, attempts to deter people from wrongdoing. But other legends, those about Agartha, with its cities Shambhala and Potala, have striking resemblances, no matter which continent they originate from. In all legends, these civilizations tell of two beings, very tall giants, or very advanced reptilian races. The word Agartha is of Buddhist origin. True Buddhists fervently believe in this subterranean empire, which they say has millions of inhabitants and many cities, including the capital, Shambhala, where a supreme ruler dwells. They believe the Dalai Lama is his terrestrial representative, and his messages are transmitted to the Lamas in Tibet. They believe that they've been there for thousands of years, sheltering humanity since the terrestrial cataclysms. The Russian artist, philosopher and explorer Nicholas Rorik published that a Tibetan Lama revealed the capital of Tibet was connected by a tunnel with Shambhala, the heart of the subterranean empire of Agartha, 
and that the entrance of this tunnel was guarded by llamas who were sworn to keep its actual whereabouts a secret from outsiders. Those who are led through this underground passage travel deep into earth through areas where it becomes so narrow it can be difficult to pass through. According to Tibetans, Shambhala is a physical place, but one that also has an ethereal nature given its location inside this holistic, evolving planet. Given our understanding of how matter can be warped in space and time by mass, this could make sense. One Gnostic scholar explains the underworld as a plane between spirit and our reality, an area where the ethers of spirit become nature and nature returns back to spirit, making it both a physical and an apparitional realm. In the ancient epic poem, the Mahabharata, the Hindus also spoke of Aryavarta, the abode of the excellent ones, which was said to be ruled by a supernal race, the Nagas, a half-human, half-reptilian species depicted with jeweled hoods that light their realm. It's said the Nagas possessed cutting-edge technology and had an unpredictable and sometimes merciless nature known to abduct and torture humans, while at other times influencing positive events on Earth. It's also said they inhabited Patala. Perhaps it's not coincidence, then, that the name of the palace where the Lamas guarded the tunnel entrances is the Patala Palace. It also raises questions about the motivation the Chinese government had when they violently overthrew Tibet's peaceful leaders in the 1950s in a coup which may have cost up to a million Tibetan lives. Another Indian epic, the Ramayana, tells the story of the great avatar Rama, a blue-skinned emissary from Agartha who arrived on an air vehicle. These air vehicles were called Vimyanas, which means car or chariot of the gods carrying its occupant through the air. Strangely, flying airships have remained a consistent part of all Inner Earth stories, every one of them. In Africa, a similar tunnel was believed to connect the secret chambers at the base of the Pyramid of Giza with the subterranean world, by which the pharaohs established contact with the gods of the underworld. Ancient Egyptian deities like Ra, Thoth, Anubis had qualities unlike humans, unique height, skin coloring, eyes, often avian or bird-like heads. Another mystery occurred in 985 AD when the Viking explorer Eric the Red discovered Greenland. By 1410, there was anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 Viking colonists on Greenland's shores. That was the last date, however, that any one of the Viking settlers of Greenland was ever seen again. All of their villages were found abandoned, and their disappearance has become one of the largest unsolved mysteries in our recent history. That is, unless you ask the native people of Greenland, the Inuits. According to these Eskimos, the white men swarmed suddenly northwards to a wonderland that the natives had long known about. They call it the land of endless summer, rich with vegetation and game. According to their legend, these colonists were lured to a land of eternal bliss inside the protective womb of the earth. In the 12th century, an unusual story of underworld beings showed up in Suffolk, England, and is still a part of the town's history today. The Children of Woolpit, Reapers in the area one day discovered two small children who had skin with a pale green hue and who spoke an unknown language. And though starving, ate only raw beans. The boy soon died, but after many years and acclamation, the surviving girl finally explained that she and her brother had come from a subterranean land where the sun never shone and where the light was more like twilight, saying they'd become lost when they followed their cattle into a cave eventually emerging onto the bright landscape. In the 1908 book, The Smoky God, Willis George Emerson tells the story of Olaf Jensen's incredible journey to Agartha and the two years he spent living there with his father. 
Jensen and his father were traveling in their small fishing boat in an attempt to find the land beyond the north wind when a windstorm carried them through a polar opening into the interior of the earth. There, they met who he called the Elder Race, friendly, intelligent, lanky, 12-foot giants. He said later they were able to grow tall in this unique electrical energy field that was always there inside the earth, and that these giants were able to live up to 800 years. Jensen described the inner world as warm, where it rained once a day and was filled with highly charged electrical air. There's a density to the atmosphere, he said, and this is what he believes led to the immense vegetation there. The title of the book, Smoky God, refers to the inner world's glowing and smoky sun. Most interesting was his explanation of these fast, noiseless, flying objects on which he rode. He said they had revolving fan-like wheels, which destroyed atmospheric pressure, or what he called gravitation, and this force prevented them from falling to one side or the other. After spending two years with these beings in Agartha, Olaf and his father attempted to return through the opening. On the journey home, however, his father lost his life when an iceberg destroyed their boat. Jensen was later rescued by some fishermen. But when he shared his incredible story, they placed him in a madhouse for the mentally insane, where, sadly, he remained for 28 years. Not until he was 90 years old did he share the story of his life's journey with Emerson, giving him maps of the interior of the earth, along with the manuscript of his experiences. Around the same time in 1895, the Nobel Prize laureate and Norwegian explorer Dr. Fridjof Nansen set on an expedition to reach the North Pole. Nansen completely lost his bearings, admitting he couldn't identify the mysterious land which he found, and that lands marked on the map of one of the best known explorers simply did not exist. He had many unusual things happen, noting that after bitter cold, suddenly the temperature began to rise and it even became unbearably hot. It was never made clear where Hansen was exactly, but as the expression goes, he was not in Kansas anymore. Deep in the Amazon jungle, the ancient Makushi Indians have remained isolated from advanced civilizations until very recently. They're said to be the guardians of an entrance to inner earth, and they describe the journey and the beings in vivid detail. They say for 15 days you must traverse through caverns until balls of bright light and glowing disks appear inside the earth. There, a civilization of very tall beings, 12 to 15 feet, live inside a lush ecosystem of vegetation. This primitive culture also describes how they encounter molten rock at deep depths. Without any modern education, how could they know such detail unless there was some truth to their story? After the First World War, a German occultist group founded the Thule Society to pursue paranormal sciences. They publicized the Tibetan legends about openings into the earth, and they became obsessed with finding these entrances, with German emissaries even visiting Tibet. This group later endorsed what became the Nazis. As the Third Reich grew in military superiority and geographical dominance, Hitler ordered a team of researchers to find an inner earth opening in Antarctica. Later, a German U-boat commanded by Henrik Broden claimed that they had reached the interior of the earth and even stated that they didn't want to come back, adding, the earth is, in fact, hollow. A diagram of Agartha was then drawn by a German scientist in 1935 in corroboration with the U-boat navigator. These stories are backed up by maps made for the National Geographic Society in 1966 by the famous cartographer Henrik Behren. In that map, Antarctica can be observed without its thick layer of ice. 
But the most interesting detail on the map are the underwater passageways spanning across the entire continent, which appear to converge at the exact location identified as the opening into Inner Earth. And then there's the disturbing part of this legend, that Hitler and many of his minions escaped Germany in the closing days of World War II and fled to Antarctica, where they escaped into the Earth's interior. For it was after the war the Allies discovered that more than 2,000 scientists from Germany and Italy, along with almost a million people, had vanished. According to the Hollow Earth Research Society in Canada, this entire culture still resides there. Of course, they were not all Nazis, but for those guilty of heinous war crimes, a higher power will have to administer justice. No investigation of Inner Earth is complete without the unique story relayed by the pioneering American aviator, Admiral Richard Byrd, Jr., who led numerous expeditions to both poles and wrote detailed logs about his journeys. What stands out about Byrd's story, however, was the personal diary his son published following his death. In this document, he gives vivid details about his expedition to the North Pole in 1947, the geographical anomalies he witnessed, which he couldn't make sense of, being met by unfamiliar flying craft, which assumed control of his plane, and then literally being taken to their leader, the master of the inner Earth civilization. Before you write this story off, it's important to understand the man who wrote it and to examine his behavior while he was alive. Richard Byrd was one of the most highly decorated officers in military history. Among these was the Medal of Honor, the highest medal given by the United States for valor. He fought for the Allies in both world wars and led two huge military expeditions to Antarctica following World War II. He was an efficient, concise leader, and every trip he made, he kept detailed logs of just facts. He was not a poet or a storyteller. The idea a man of this rank and stature would fabricate stories is unimaginable. You only need to see Byrd in his documentaries or read his writings to see that he sought to live with integrity, that he understood the responsibility of his words and choices on the lives of those reporting to him and to the nation that he served. So when Byrd returned from his travels and was interviewed on the Longin Chronicles on live TV in 1954, the hyperbolic statements he made were, and still are, somewhat confusing and mysterious. He said things like, I'd like to see the land beyond the pole. Now he didn't say to, around, or near it. He called it the land of everlasting mystery, the most peaceful place in the world, and a vast new territory not on any map. He said it was an area as big as the U.S., never seen by a human being, and the most valuable and important place left in the world for science. Prior to another expedition, he said, this is the most important expedition in the history of the world. And the one he repeated the most was, it's the center of the great unknown. These are mysterious when you consider that he's referring to either a large mass of ice or a land mass covered with ice. Even if he were speaking of the military significance of this place, to call it peaceful and mysterious are hardly the words of a strategizing military officer. So we must conclude that as one of the nation's highest ranking military leaders, he was also sworn to secrecy. These statements raise the question, was Byrd upholding his vow to secrecy for national security while being just truthful enough to share information that would allow him to abide by his principles of integrity? In February of 47, Byrd, the one man who has done the most to make the North Pole a known area, made the following statement. I'd like to see the land beyond the pole, the center of the great unknown. Millions of people read this statement in their newspapers or heard it on the radio broadcast. Did they look at their globes? What land was he talking about? If you look at the map, 
calculate the distance from all the known lands near it, and none of them are within 200 miles of the pole. In fact, Bird himself called it no known land, that after 1,700 miles, he said he hadn't reached the end of it. He should have been back to civilization, right? But he wasn't. He should have seen nothing but ice-covered ocean, or at the very most, partially open ocean. Instead, he was flying over green, lush areas, including lakes and mountains. It was already published that he had discovered two unknown land areas, measuring a total of 4,000 miles across. And yet, instead of receiving notoriety like Christopher Columbus, his story disappeared. Was Bird trying to say what he knew without revealing it outright? Was anybody paying attention? To add to this confusion, in 1956, the editor of Flying Saucer magazine, Ray Palmer, wrote a detailed story on Bird's discoveries. Apparently, however, as the issue headed to press, they mysteriously disappeared. And strangely, the printing plates were found badly damaged, so a reprint couldn't be done. Some other interesting indisputable facts about the time were that, up to this point, there had been a few books published about the North Pole having entrances into the Earth. Another thing was that Bird was accused of lying in an effort to receive credit for being the first person to the North Pole, an accusation that seems somewhat inconsistent with a man of his character. Another thing that Bird shared was that the poles are concave, not convex, his thought and that the South Pole is 10,000 feet high, whereas the North Pole is 10,000 feet low. It was well documented that there was a large spike in temperature as he approached the pole. But one of the biggest mysteries involving Byrd may have happened right after World War II with Operation High Jump. While it was said at the time it was an expedition to Antarctica to find coal and other resources, that story later changed to training military personnel and establishing a research base. In the meantime, you can't help but wonder why either mission would require 33 aircraft, 13 Navy ships, and almost 5,000 soldiers, and mysteriously result in loss of lives. Leaks later revealed that the true mission was to retrieve the missing Nazi leaders from their refuge at Antarctica but Byrd cut the eight-month mission short after what the Chilean press reported as troubles with many fatalities, though the event was clearly downplayed in the U.S. Following a military-aided evacuation, the force returned. Their stories immediately became classified as top secret, but inevitable leaks revealed that there were attacks by highly advanced saucer-shaped airships. The Secretary of the Navy, by this time the Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal, started to talk. President Truman forced him to resign, and he was soon taken to Bethesda Naval Hospital's psychiatric ward, where he was prevented from seeing or talking to anyone, including his own wife. When this high-ranking man was found dead, of course, it was ruled a suicide. Case closed. Another strange thing is in 1947, following the sudden end of his military expedition, Bird spoke with a reporter for the Chilean newspaper El Mercurio and told him that he didn't want to frighten anyone unduly, but that it was a bitter reality that in the case of a new war, the continental U.S. would be attacked by flying objects which could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. This is where Byrd's posthumous diary comes in. Though he remained faithfully silent, albeit mysterious, shortly after his death, his son published his diary to reveal a very different account than what the public had been told. It started like this. I must write this diary in secrecy and obscurity. It concerns my Arctic flight on the 19th day of February in the year of 1947. There comes a time when the rationality of men must fade into insignificance, and one must accept the unavailability of the truth. I am not at liberty to disclose the following documentation of this writing. Perhaps it shall never see the light of public scrutiny, 
but I must do my duty here for all to read one day. Hopefully, the greed and exploitation of certain of mankind can no longer suppress that which is truth. Bird then continued to unveil a picture that we had not imagined in this diary. He said that he traveled 1,700 miles on this journey. And he was so surprised when ice below gave way to lush green forests, lakes, rivers, and mountains. He saw animal life and to his dismay realized he was looking at a large mammoth that resembled those now extinct. He noted that everything had unique and inexplicable color. And suddenly he realized in shock that there were some kind of space vehicles flying beside him. They escorted him and he saw an entire city and was safely landed despite the fact he had no control over his plane. Once there, he was graciously greeted by civilians and they called this place Agartha. Bird's dismay upon arrival is clear. He and his crew were then taken to meet what they were told was the ruler of Agartha, the master, whom he described as delicate and ancient. They were told they'd been allowed to enter despite these invisible barriers because of his high moral and ethical character. The ruler went on to say that ever since the U.S. had dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, their race had been very concerned for human safety and the survival of the planet. When they intervened, however, their craft had been attacked by our militaries, and Bird was asked to share this message and warning to civilization. Their hosts then guided them to their plane and back to the outer world. In closing, Bird said he briefed the Pentagon of his message from the Master, was interviewed intently by top security forces and a medical team, and ordered to remain silent in regard to all that he learned on behalf of humanity. Incredible is all he could call it. He concluded, I'm reminded that I am a military man and I must obey orders. Ten years later, he wrote a final entry. These last few years elapsed since 1947 have not been kind. I must state that I have faithfully kept this matter secret as directed all these years. It's been completely against my values of moral right. Now, I seem to sense the long night coming on and this secret will not die with me. But as all truth shall, it will triumph and so it shall. This can be the only hope for mankind. I've seen the truth and it has quickened my spirit and has set me free. I've done my duty towards the monstrous military industrial complex. Now, the long night begins to approach, but there shall be no end. Just as the long night of the Arctic ends, the brilliant sunshine of truth shall come again, and those who are of darkness shall fall in its light. For I have seen that land beyond the pole, that center of the great unknown. Needless to say, this is an extraordinary story from an extraordinary man. Would Bird's own son publish false information that would defame his beloved father? Or did Bird himself falsify all this story in order to make a cruel joke of his life and legacy? Whether or not you believe this story, his influence, moral stature, and valor can hardly be argued. The esoteric Tibetan teacher, Yuval Kul, or DK, during life channeled information from his location in Tibet to Alice Bailey in the United States, whom he later met personally. Even after his death, Bailey continued to receive information from this enlightened spiritual teacher called the Messenger of the Masters, committed to world service in the healing of humanity. DK confirmed that Bird did indeed travel to Inner Earth as he claimed, that there's a sun there, but not like our outer sun, he said that the aurora borealis was not caused by this, but by a different light source, and that the openings of the poles were very wide and ships and planes could fly into it. However, a yet unknown energy field will camouflage it and naturally protect it. He confirmed that there were entrances to the inner earth in Egypt, Tibet, and the Yucatan, and also added that there were other entrances in the Bermuda Triangle, the Soviet Union, and Africa. He said that there were different races in the inner earth, just like on the surface, and some of them quite tall. He also confirmed the U.S. government and other countries are aware of the inner earth 
and are covering up the fact as they are the UFOs and extraterrestrials. Another man, Dallas Thompson, appeared on Coast to Coast Radio. He was a personal trainer in California who, during an out-of-body death experience, had revelations of inner earth. After his recovery, he became an avid researcher, intending to find and travel the hole that Bird said to have entered at the North Pole. In 2003, after months of planning, however, he mysteriously disappeared. Finally, the most notable whistleblower of the secret space program, Corey Good, has given consistent and extensive details on Inner Earth. Among his claims are that there is a huge population currently living in Antarctica, that the United States is not the only nation that's created underground bases that are inhabited by thousands of people. Corey Good has shared that the Mayans were not defeated, but in fact retreated to the inner earth. He claims that the Mayans have crafts which appear to be rock, but they look like long cigars, cylindrical in shape. Good's description of the Mayan craft are not unlike this one, which entered our solar system from a distant galaxy not long ago and has since been recorded as speeding up? He also notes that there are many people channeling what they believe are Pleiadians, but those are in fact inner Earth beings protecting their location by claiming to be off the planet. Good also said that disclosure will be an Earth-shattering event, but a necessary one, and he implores everyone to see the Earth as a maternal living thing inviting us to seek a deeper relationship with our planet. In our drive for power, resources, and control, we become disconnected and impartial to the effects our choices have on the balance of nature. In conclusion, perhaps you hear these stories and can only hear legend. They're just too fantastical to be true. Suspend your disbelief for a moment, however, and other tales start to make more sense. The explanation of Earth's strange magnetic anomalies and its shadow zones. It explains the thousands of mysterious crafts, including the many which have been witnessed shutting down nuclear weapons. That they could be right under our feet, not coming from some distant place in space. It explains the obsession with Antarctica and the complete denial by governments of all unidentified flying objects. It explains the omission of the poles and satellite pictures, the laws preventing one from flying over them. It explains the disappearance of hundreds of thousands of Germans at the end of World War II, and even the survival of the human race throughout what Mayan calendar claims was four Earth cataclysms. The Earth has many mysteries, and you only need to turn on the series Planet Earth to marvel at how little we know from our perspective. After all, Remember, it was only a few hundred years ago that humanity believed you would fall off the end of the planet if you sailed away too far. Exploring the science and the stories about a hollow Earth has revealed far more information than we could possibly share in this video, but we hope you'll continue to investigate the topic yourself. In the words of Richard Feynman, the famous quantum mechanics physicist, if you thought that science was certain, well, that's just an error on your part. Thank you for watching and hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. We hope you'll subscribe and if you'd like to be notified of future releases, just hit the bell button.